Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Budapest. We are currently at the Pain in Europe 13, so the 13th Congress of the European Pain Federation. Um, we will have the Epic TV studio, as you see here, will be out live, so do remember to subscribe for the YouTube channel. So we don't have a schedule, we'll be catching speakers as they pass by and doing interviews with them. And here with me this morning, our first guest in the studio, is Professor Lars Aaron Nielsen. Uh, Lars, you are Danish and you are a professor of experimental and clinical pain research, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And you've been a professor for quite a while. Yeah, I think uh, they uh, told me recently that it has been uh, 25 years, so... Uh, <laughs> and you told <laughs> me you, you didn't even celebrate. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> it's not important, is no, it? No, it's not really important, no, I don't care about it. <laughs> but now that we have you here, I mean, it would be lovely to have a, a, maybe a look back and maybe reflect on where, where did you get an interest in pain research? I mean, the conferences here are also to generate interest in pain and research in pain, because we need that, and we need more researchers mm. and clinicians to have an interest in pain. So how did, how, who or how did your interest start? <laughs> well, uh, when I started off uh, with these uh, activities uh, in the, the early 80s, there was fundamentally very little interest in, in pain and pain research. I mean, the, th the first textbook on, on pain came in, I think, in 84. And at that time, I was actually working in London. I was at the National Hospital of Nervous Diseases, and I was following Pat Wall's uh, courses on the neurobiology of pain. And uh, he, was, he was a very fascinating uh, lecturer. He was always smoking his cigarettes, you know, and uh, he was always drawing things on the blackboard. And, uh, and then very, uh, very often he, uh, he raised the question, I mean, why don't we measure pain uh, more quantitatively in humans? And uh, he continued to say that. And then after a year, and I heard that over and over again, I thought, well, okay, maybe there's something we should do here. <laughs> and and how, how did people, how did people measure pain back in the 80s, 90s? Yeah, but I mean, there were a few groups around the world uh, working on, on quantitative assessment and quantitative sensory testing and, and pain assessment in general. But I mean, it was, uh, it was not really uh, very developed. Uh, and technologies were simple, uh, but, but I think in, in the 80s, uh, late 80s, it started to, to, to take off and, and more and more technologies were invented and, and more and more people got interested and I think that was the drive of the whole thing. Yeah, and, and I know the, the area where you work in Auburn University, which is where I work as well, <laughs> is, is, is one of the foremost uh, research centers in the world for musculoskeletal pain. I guess that's building on those ideas of PATS that, that you sort of Yeah, that was uh, one of the topics we focused on. Uh, it was very interesting. I think Pat Wall and Clifford Wolf at that time, they showed that stimulating uh, afferents from muscles were actually much more potent in generating centralized uh, or central changes in the nervous system and, 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 and as opposed to afferents from skin exactly yeah. and that's why we were quite fascinated by the by the fact that the the, the muscle system as such is such a prominent driver of, of, of pain and such a prominent driver of of changes in the central nervous system. So, so we were focusing a lot on that actually from the very first beginning. And I can understand how you can study muscle activation mm. in an animal. Oh yeah. Uh, and there might be some people who don't like that, but <laughs> I guess that, yeah. you know, you cut them open and you can yeah, yeah. access the muscles. Sure. How do you do that in humans or how did you do it in, yeah, in the Yeah, I mean, there were, there were different ways of doing it. I mean, we, uh, we used different uh, algogenic substances, substances which we knew activated the, the nociceptors in the, in the muscles. And uh, we could then provoke the, provoke the, the muscle, very pure muscle skeletal uh, pain um, conditions and uh, and we could look at the manifestations I mean there are these interesting referred pain patterns there are these changes in the the connectivity and uh, and a whole lot of uh, fundamental aspects were suddenly opened up in the in the in the um, field was of, that uh, hypertonic saline or was it hypertonic saline or? NDF uh, substance P uh, NGF I mean you name it yeah. you could try to inject whatever and I mean the, the interesting thing was that I mean we could we could or we can still we can we can stimulate specific receptors yeah and that was interesting because at some stage you know the stimulating by NDF then suddenly the the there were developments in the in the area of 
anti-NGF. So you could actually now suddenly start to to use the experimental models also for proof of concept yeah. uh, for screening and, and profiling uh, new compounds with the targeting uh, specific receptors. And I think that was kind of a, a really a step forward uh, where you could actually do really quantitative proof of concept studies in, in humans using the experimental model as a proxy for what is happening in yeah, so really I mean, teasing out the mechanism as teasing well. out the mechanisms yeah. and use that for understanding a little bit more about the clinical conditions I mean they are not clinical models but they are proxies for mechanisms involved in in clinical conditions and I think that was one of the the things which was uh, actually uh, novel at that time. <laughs> yeah. And I, so how did things develop from there? Yeah, what, then what I mean, the steps to where yeah, we I mean, are today? Yeah, then there were all these uh, developments in the area of brain imaging. We all did uh, EEG, which was easily available. I was in Japan uh, doing studies with first, some of the first um, uh, magnetic uh, resonance uh, imaging. Uh, yeah. Uh, Magnetic, uh, elect what's it called? Magnetic oh. uh, responses from the brain. Yeah. Uh, huge, big machines, very noisy and clumsy. But uh, and then you know all the things developed. The fMRIs got got much better. The res resolution got much better. And now, I mean, we can start also combining the technology. So I think that has been that has been a dramatic change over the years. And and more recently. Uh, many of the biomarkers. I mean, because there are no really good, what we could call biomarkers or serological biomarkers for, for pain. But in recent years, uh, we and many others, we have been focusing on not so much on the genetics because it didn't, it didn't show really massive changes in, in pain patients. There were some, but not really explaining a lot. But yeah, so those who have pain are not genetically different from those I mean, there are these very pain. extreme groups, but, but, but otherwise it was not so, um, so important. But, but I think what, what has happened recently is that we have been looking more into these epigenetic changes. I mean, how the, the, the environmental, how, how environmental factors can actually influence uh, and how the do you genes measure that in the serum? So in the blood? Is yeah, that yeah. What you measure? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can do it in, in, in different t tissues, but the, 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 um, the samples uh, from the blood, you can extract uh, these microRNAs and you can see uh, how they are upregulated. And we just published a paper actually showing that a, a short lasting muscle skeletal insult is actually causing a massive upregulation of microRNAs over the coming 24 hours yeah and I think that's a little it's a little scary because I mean how can a five minute muscle skeletal insult how can that actually have such a massive effect on how the genes are operating yeah I guess the world is scary when we when we first realize it I mean <laughs> I imagine the first people looking into a microscope and saw that uh oh we're yeah, not yeah. alone yeah yeah but yeah. I mean I think for the epigenetics I mean at least animal do animal data show that it can be inherited to the next generation so who knows that yeah. if you have throughout your life span you have a lot of painful events maybe they are accumulating by these epigenetic modifications. I don't know if they're resetting. Nobody knows if they're resetting in humans. So, I mean, suddenly we may actually reach a level where we're suddenly triggering a yeah. chronic condition. I mean, I don't know, but I mean... And, and this is what we're here for, isn't it? That this is what the conference is all about, is to find out what is the cutting edge of exactly, the pain Exactly, and discussing these yeah. kind of crazy ideas and uh, yeah. uh, taking, uh, taking next steps. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, this is the exciting thing about meeting people. Exactly. <laughs> and about meeting people, I, I thought it would be interesting to, to reflect on... So, when, when I first came into pain research, there was a... So the venue, we just talked about the venue was different. Yeah. There was lots of, of people there. Specifically, mm. there was a lot of industry representatives yeah. and yeah. and uh, it was different. Um, do, uh, so I'm thinking, was there a dis disruption at some point? Again, easy to mind is, of course, the opioid crisis. Yeah, Did yeah. you see that as a disruption? And um, There was a kind of a disruption because uh, the farmer industry had been very visible at the meetings and they are 
I mean, now here in Budapest, they are, they are, the, the commercial exhibitions are, are shrinking at the World Conference on, on, on pain. Uh, the commercial exhibitions are shrinking. First of all, we don't have many new drugs, so that's one reason. But I think there has also been a, a concern about uh, the, um, the involvement of, of industry in, 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 in the scientific organization. And I think the whole opioid crisis was actually triggering it. And, yeah. and I know that, 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 that the organizations are really very compliant. I mean, they have really very high levels of, 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 of compliance. Uh, industry is getting very restricted in what they can sponsor. Uh, in old days, lots of people were sponsored by industry to come to the meetings. That's not really happening anymore. Uh, so, so there has been a, 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 a dramatic change uh, in that landscape, yeah. uh, for the good, uh, and maybe also for the for the for the bad to some yeah. degree. So has that spun off? I don't know. But we were just talking about this on the way here. Mm. Uh, so the changes that is occurring, and, and you mentioned that maybe uh, the, in the scientific journals where mm. we publish our research, they're going to go open access. Is that what you? Yeah, think there's going to a whole, a whole lot of things are happening now. I mean, most of the uh, the, the the journals are going to change into open access. Uh, I know from different organisations that they will they will lose revenue. Uh, I mean. European Journal of Pain is generating revenue for IFIC, uh, Pain uh, is generating revenue for, for ISP, but those kind of revenues will go down once the journals are open access. So organizations are going to lose money. Uh, they're going to also lose money on the, on the, uh, on the conferences because as, as we talked about, the commercial the exhibitions are shrinking. Yeah. They normally, you know, pay for being there and the less companies, the less income. Yeah. Uh, the number of attendees is also going down. Things are getting more hybrid. So I think we are in a, a very kind of transient period where I don't, don't know what will, what will happen, but I, I, I still think that meeting people, networking, I mean, is really the, the crucial thing. I mean, during the pandemic, we were all behind the, 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 the screens. And That's I mean, true. we were not creative. I mean, we could keep things going, but we didn't, I mean, at least I didn't generate a whole lot of new ideas and, 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 and projects. But coming here, you're going to meet so many people and at the end of the day, you have generated, I don't know how many new projects. So, yeah. so that's the whole advantage. And, and networking, I mean, people to do projects with as well. Isn't networking it? is yeah. the most important thing. And I think the other thing which has happened, and you can call it a disruption or not, but I mean, there has been a very strong focus also on the involvement of, 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 of patient organization, with people with lived experience. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, initiating that for the International Association for the Study of Pain. IFIC has been ahead of that for a long time, interacting with patient alliances. Yeah. And I think this is really important. Uh, and and uh, I'm very happy that it's, uh, it's happening because, I mean, input from patient, patient organizations is, uh, is key for, uh, for our work. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess back 10, 15 years back, there was uh, there was a lot of focus on what researchers found yeah. was important. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that ties into how industry was was also working, but at least nowadays uh, the the lived experience of pain and yeah. even here there's people uh, joining here who are, who are experiencing pain and, exactly and trying to sort of also engage with researchers to spark interest and yeah, yeah. engage and, in networks. Uh, and it, and it's so important and and the the value is is really. Uh, it's really uh, adding a lot to uh, to the organizations. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very happy that it's it's happening. So I guess the disruptions have good and bad sides. But you mentioned the COVID as well. So <laughs> I, I definitely that was a disruption. I mean, the wasn't COVID, it? COVID was a disruption. I mean, I was <laughs> it was at the days when I was the president of the National International Association for the Study of Pain, and I remember we were I was sitting in my my cottage in March 2020 and had to decide whether the World Conference in August in in Amsterdam should continue or should be cancelled. So, I mean, I, I think I continued until end of April saying, of course, we, we <laughs> planned as usual, or planned yeah. as, <laughs> we go ahead as planned. And <laughs> But then at some stage, uh, we had to, to pull the plug, and, uh, but, but that was so weird. And then within, I mean, literally within weeks, you know, all this uh, Zoom, Teams, 
whatever it's called, uh, took over. And yeah. we were sitting in front of our computers uh, 12 hours a day. Uh, it, was, it was bad, but I mean, the, the good thing is that, I mean, somehow that technology developed yeah. so rapidly. And I mean, now we can use it, uh, you know, for, for purposes which are... Yeah, I guess technology just made an entrance into everyone's lives at everyday basis. Exactly. Instead and of only being emails and, and yeah. you know, so, work documents. So, so I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was strange and bad times, but you know, something is always coming out of it at the end. And, uh, and that's and one of the where things. Where do you see we're going now? So what's the sort of, What's the new thing? So you mentioned MRI, sorry, uh, microRNAs. MicroRNAs, I mean, epigenetic modifications, I mean, it's a new field. It has been uh, in the area of, of cancer for, for many years, but in pain, I mean, it's a, it's a novel thing. Uh, I think the, uh, the other area which is of, of interest for us and we have to dig into it is how to utilize different uh, artificial intelligence in in pain. Uh, yeah, there's no getting around artificial intelligence there's, nowadays. There's, there? there's no way to uh, to avoid it. I mean, we just have to use it. Uh, how, how do you see it being used in pain research? Are you doing anything? Yeah, we're doing. We're doing. Yeah, actually, I have a I have a, a lecture keynote here at the EFIC meeting in, in Budapest, and uh, and uh, and I will uh, I will uh, I will introduce something where you we have provided this AI uh, machine with millions of data uh, from actually some COVID uh, patients. Yeah, because you are following a cohort of people who, who had COVID and yeah. then some have pain yeah. afterwards yeah. and some yeah. don't? Yeah, I'm heading a huge uh, American, a huge uh, European study, pan-European study on, on lung COVID. Uh, we started that already in 21 but when we started to see the the long COVID problems I guess it's yeah. easy to understand why that's interesting for everyone but what what's the interest so sort of the specific scientific interest why yeah, but, why but follow the, this group the, specifically the, the the specific interest is because we have patients who are developing pain and somebody who's who are not developing pain they have fundamentally been infected by the same virus but some are developing a pain condition and some, some are not developing the pain condition. And this is exactly what we see in so many other clinical conditions. I mean, diabetic neuropathies. Why are some, somebody developing a painful diabetic neuropathies and others are not? Why is it that somebody is developing pain after chemotherapy and others are not? So, I mean, we have so many questions where we have fundamentally the same pathology but some developing pain and some, somebody's not developing pain. And I think if we should say, say, say anything good about the, the pandemic, which is of course very difficult, but the good thing is that we have millions of people who have had the exact same, we could call it disease, where some is developing pain, some is not. And that is exactly something which we have to understand and that's yeah. what we're doing. Obviously very unfortunate for those who have pain, but yeah. again, from a research perspective, yeah. the, the, the sort of grand idea is that maybe they can tell us something about chronic pain that we don't know today. Exactly, so it's a unique situation and we need to, uh, we need to, to look into it. And, and yeah. we are now using the AI technology because we have, we have millions of data yeah. from all over Europe. And I mean, these AI machines are, are crunching the data and providing us with, with some information which we, I mean, I think a few months ago, didn't have a chance to look into. But now, I mean, these technologies are developing so rapidly. And, and, and we just have to utilize it one way or the other. For people out there who are not attending your keynote tomorrow, can you, can you hint on, no, on, yeah, on but I mean, what we, you're going to we, tell we, us? Uh, we took a whole lot of these uh, millions uh, of uh, long COVID questionnaire data and we put it into uh, to the AI machine and asked it to uh, come up with predictors for who are developing pain and who are not developing pain. And this machine did combined all these billions of data and found the most optimal combination of predictors. I mean, I could have spent the rest of my life looking for that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what are you going to do with that data now? If, yeah, but, uh, if you have the funding and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I mean, now we, have com now we have looked at all the questionnaire data. The next thing is we have to combine it with all the registered data. We can have socioeconomic factors, we can have all medicine, we can have all uh, previous uh, diseases. We can combine it with all tons of data. And I mean, bringing all those together in, in one big uh, analysis is actually the opportunity we have. Yeah. Uh, and uh, honestly speaking, I mean, we couldn't have, I mean, I, we couldn't have done it months ago, I mean. 
No. Is it? <laughs> well, I guess that's that's a nice ending point as well because we started out fairly slow, so there's yeah. been a long process of, yeah, yeah. of generating the whole research field, and yeah. and then there's been a period where it was bigger, the conferences were bigger. Yeah, yeah. But it, definitely the research hasn't, yeah. you know, started to slow down at all. No, no, I mean I, I think the whole AI area is. I mean, it's. Uh, we have to utilize it, uh, and we can use the technology to do uh, to help us, uh, and it can free out free free time for for more for more creativity. So yeah. I think that's a way to look at it. Thank you very much for your time, Lars. Thank you and so thank much. Thank you much for listening and and watching us out there. Uh, my name is Morton Ho, and uh, I'll be back with more researchers from the FX Studio. Thank you.